Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 399. Hey, oh boy. Oh, I hope we live up to the 399. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 29th of May, 2018, and I guess this makes it a penultimate edition. Okay, Gavin, welcome to another show. Uh, I See, you've been using backgrounds now, so I can't really tell if you're at the castle <laughs> or if you're back in uh, England. Uh, where are you this week? Uh, so I know that I'm not at the French mill shack. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm back in my little alpine alpine house in, in along the welsh border in shropshire and um uh yes it's 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 uh, it's it's great to be back i i had to come back in order to do an interview with the sunday times i got given a platform by one of our uh, more exciting journalists rod little to to um do a video interview for the okay. papers on the great curry sermon it was a great it was a great privilege now i've teased you enough about the your, your french uh chateau uh tell Jack. me uh, Jack, <laughs> <laughs> tell me a little bit about, about your online ministry on facebook uh i and other people can participate in the morning prayer you uh post every week it's uh, live but you can watch it throughout the day um how did that get started I had a very strange experience about a year and a quarter ago. I was uh, sitting in the back of the church just before I left the Church of England, uh, complaining to the Lord, saying, um, surely you, we haven't gone this far for me to sit at the back of a church, <laughs> giving the preacher marks out of ten. And um, uh, I heard the Lord say to me, the sermon you've got in your head, go home and preach it on the Internet. And sure. I, I said, I said that's crazy. I, I I I can't preach into a camera. It's hard enough talking to Kevin into a camera. Um, and then shortly after I'd done that, or well, we we struck a deal. I said, Lord, there are forty-two people in church. If if by tomorrow you give me more than forty-two people who've listened to this sermon out of nowhere on YouTube, we'll do it the following week. Um, and and the Lord patch got two hundred. So. I did it the following week, and then I then I heard him speak to me again and said, "Okay, now do morning prayers on on Facebook, kind of fa Facebook Live." I only just discovered it, and one of the things I, I I found was that it immediately attracted some people who said, "We are alone, we can't pray, we can't get to church. Uh, this is great. This is fellowship." And what I discovered was that the Lord was using the internet as a kind of rather like an in, an internet monastery. I mean, uh, certainly an internet community. And so, um, however, uh, uh, however shallow the sermons are, uh, there is a small community of people who come and gather together as a kind of uh, internet internet ministry, and um, it's it's growing. So clearly, there's some need for it, and it, it, it's all found either on a uh, morning prayer is on my Facebook account, and it's always public, and then the sermons are on YouTube. Uh, well, you said you have a community. You actually keep up with each other. Uh, and communicate through Facebook. It's not yes, just people, sit down it, it, and, and listen to Gavin, but mm, there's a community no, no. growing. P people say, look, at the, um, hey, you guys, pray for this. So, mm -hmm. you know, during the prayers, there's a response button and, and people uh, um, people write things while we're praying. And that, that allows us all to take them away. There are enormous numbers of people. Um, by the end of the day, there's somewhere between 100 and 250 people who've, who've joined in. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, if I was a parish priest, um, there aren't many parishes where you get 200 people to, to say morning prayer. It's what Cranmer intended. He intended, after the fall of the monasteries for the parish churches, to become lay lay centres of daily prayer. Mm -hmm. But it turns out, of course, it's only the, mainly the clergy. But um, the internet has revivified Cranmer's vision and allowed us to draw people together to pray. People don't have to pray together, but some people like it. No. Well, it's a great transition into my like, share, comment, subscribe section of Anglican Unscripted. Uh, this is a great chance for you guys to be interactive with our show. If you could click the like button on Facebook and YouTube, that'd be great. Uh, before you watch the show, don't wait till after. Before mm -hmm. you watch the show and judge what we're saying, share. Send this to your <laughs> friends, your family, your priest, your parish. Uh, that'd be great. Uh, comment. We've got lots of comments uh, that we keep up with all the time, and they're, they're fun to read and go through. Um, every once in a while, I'll read some on the air. Uh, we don't really have time for that this week. And subscribe. We're up to just over 3,000 subscribers. Um, amazing. Keep uh, subscribing if you haven't yet, because that's the only way you're going to really find out if there's a new show right away. Um, so that's cool. Lots been happening in England. Um, 
there's I can think of four or five different stories to talk about. Um, let's just stick with the Anglican and Christian ones. That's what we'll do. Okay. <laughs> just I got kind of, so many going through my mind. There's the Tommy Robinson one, and yeah, Great that's the, let let the the press handle that over there. Let's talk about some of the Anglican stories first. Uh, the last episode I did with you, or the the episode called uh, "The Gospel According to Bishop Michael Curry," is one of our most watched episodes ever. Uh, right now, it's yeah, I guess well over four thousand views, um, which is great. Maybe we'll hit five thousand, but there's a lot of attention still on the fifteen minutes of fame that uh, the presiding bishop garnered for himself, because right now we, I kind of see a divide uh, within the church of the importance of this uh, in, in our daily lives. Was it gospel? And then there's an argument. Uh, was it John Lennonism? There's an argument, you know, and so uh, you just mentioned you had an interview here uh, in London that you came back for. What was the topic? Well, the the one of Rod Little, who's one of our more uh, colorful commentators mm -hmm. and particularly a scourge of the he, he, he is quite left wing, but he hates the kind of neo-Marxism, the false egalitarianism. Uh, he used to be a BBC producer of the, the biggest political radio program we have, and he now writes in the Sunday Times in a magazine called Spectator. Anyway, he's merciless when it comes to political correctness and Islamic Im immigration, and he's really quite clever and gifted. Uh, and he wrote to me and said, um, uh, would, can I interview you for the Sunday Times? The Sunday Times is one of our, our bigger papers. Uh, and in fact, one of the first things I do on Sunday mornings is I, 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 look, I go to his com column his column and there there is a, he has this video interview and it's always it's always very provocative and interesting and I love it so I was really very very touched when he wrote to me and said come and come and do it and he said let's stand outside Lambeth Palace <laughs> wow and, see and, I, we and, can't and, do that on Anglican TV we can't just give that you know uh, atmosphere going um uh, that's right. Although there are sophisticated backdrops we can use, projecting things on the back screen. But <laughs> yes, next year, maybe. Um, so he he uh, um, he's a quiet Christian. Uh, he he's come out as a Christian from time to time, but essentially he was very critical indeed of the Curry sermon. He mm -hmm. simply said it was vacuous, and uh, he asked me to come and explain in the newspaper why it was vacuous. Um, so then we've done that. But the really interesting thing that somebody wrote to me during the week is, uh, I think, much more important and will give us um, uh, a firmer platform to talk creatively about. And that the comment was that the Curry sermon will, will be forgotten within a month or so. People will remember uh, he upstaged um, Meghan and her dress for a bit and uh, he got talked about more than the bride, um, which isn't really <laughs> the, the uh, proper ambition for clergy taking weddings, but it happened. It happened and it was colourful. But but the comment was, what will stay for the next 20 years is not the memory of his sermon, but the division within the church about, um, well, I'm not, I left something on that's clinging, sorry. Oh, the sorry. division in the church uh, between those who thought the Curry sermon was really okay uh, and a splendid event and quite faithful, and those for whom very serious alarm bells rung. Of course, this partly depends on what level you approach the thing. If you approach it as a superficial level, Everyone can say great. Here is a Christian ceremony reaching two billion people um, with 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 words from the Bible read out and faithful prayers offered and a sermon preached. What's not to like? If you go down one level, you say, well, what's not to like is the fact that the gospel was distorted, the way in which Jesus relates to people, the true nature of God, which doesn't have much to do with romantic love, but has to do with, with holiness and mercy. Uh, yeah, that was distorted. Go down one more level and you have... A man whose church uh, spent $50 million persecuting Orthodox Christians, standing up there saying, love like me and the world will come right. And that, you know, that's that's not good. No. So de depending on which level you enter this thing, the conversation is different. But um, one of the things we're having now is, is uh, arguments about the discernment of the change of culture. So 500 years ago, we had a reformation because the the church of the west at the time had allowed itself to move too far away from primary gospel values and people who read the bible said you can't go in that direction there are many people me amongst them saying today we need another reformation 500 years later nothing to do with indulgences or purgatory this time or the mass but but actually something just as important the church is buying into a secular 
neo-Marxist philosophy that has nothing to do with the Gospels and reconfiguring the church and Jesus and the New Testament around this particular model, squeezing it out of shape. And that's what Curry was doing. So let's forget about Curry, but talk about the project because it's not just him. We'll discover that the Church of England is continuing with the project in its own, its own sweet way and tech is doing it too. <laughs> and there's a division between two kinds of Christianity, those going with the zeitgeist and those saying, wait a minute, we have to test it with the values in the Gospels. Well, no, I agree with this a lot because uh, from time to time, occasionally I will go on websites like the Telegraph or the Daily Mail and just see what's going on. And uh, there's a lot going on within uh, the realm of the Church of England and the realm of uh, UK politics. I saw the Diocese of Litchfield say, it's time to welcome transgendered people into the priesthood, to, to let them know that you know, there's a voice for them here, uh, in our diocese at least, uh, where they can become priests and become a part of the life of the church. And then I saw, uh, I guess it was the House of Lords. Forgive me if I'm, forgive me if I'm wrong. I'm not English. You know, I'm white. That's about it. <laughs> um, I, I'm not English. Uh, but said, mm -hmm. uh, we need more diversity in the church. We need the Church of England to have far more black people, far more brown people, far more uh, women, uh, less white people. Look, okay, all we need is less white people. If you can provide less white people, we, the House of Lords, would be very happy. And I was expecting, I don't know why, oh, one second here. I was expecting, uh, what, does everything go off? <laughs> We're gonna take a, a mindless second here to uh, answer this. Hello? I do not, I think she's on her way to pick you up. All right, bye-bye. So I will <clears throat> take that interruption out. <laughs> <laughs> Neatly done. I'm well, a father. I'm a we're father. Busy. We're busy people in demand. <laughs> we are. <laughs> okay, I'm going to leave the interruption there. That was my son calling because my daughter had not picked him up on time. And apparently my kids have no patience. She was a minute late. She wasn't supposed to be there until a minute ago. And so who does he call? Dad. That's lovely. So I saw, you know, the, the House of Lords and the Diocese of Litchfield telling the Church of England how to do their job. And I'm, I was waiting patiently for maybe Lambeth to say, this is silly. Maybe a church house put out a little uh, a press release saying, well, we heard what the, the House of Lords is saying, but uh, we know better. Didn't hear it one little peep out of you guys. Uh, are you guys deaf? What's going on, Gavin? Well, what's going on is exactly this, the, the, the culture that, that I've described, bringing pressure to bear on how the church works. So all heresy takes a good idea and then it twists it out of shape and takes it too far. That's what happens. So as with the Diocese of Litchfield and transgenderism, um, the gospel is about taking people who are broken and wounded and sinful and distorted and, and, and mending them. It's great. Um, but what it does is, the, the critical thing here is that, that, that um, we, we, we get to repent or we get to turn from, um, from, from what, what we did before. The trouble with transgenderism is that, that it's always been agreed that essentially it's basically a mental illness, mm -hmm. that, that, the, um, th that it, it, the kind of the handshake in the brain between the biology of the body and the perception of the mind yeah, uh, is, <laughs> is, is out of kilter. And um, you should you need a, a red flag you can yeah, wave. I, I need a, the <laughs> a uh, recording bell. in the studio light to come on, but uh, yes, right. I'm sure they'll be quiet in a second. Keep going. <laughs> so um, there is something out of kilter, kilter in the transgendered person. And uh, does this mean that transgendered people are not loved, forgiven, blessed by, by the Lord? Of course it doesn't. But what it also doesn't mean is that we don't take transgenderism and say, this is a model for the new Christian anthropology. Correct. Um, and so the idea, but so why might this happen? Well, it might happen because the church has taken the idea that, uh, the, 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 the neo-Marxist idea, that we have to have a re-inversion of power. The people at the top, um, the same, very same people who cycle through London, we'll come to that in a moment, uh, white men in particular, um, white straight men need to be put at the bottom and people at the bottom need to go to the top and so this 
this realignment of social categories along the idea of um, of gender politics and identity politics, which is a political uh, campaign, has been taken over by the church because, well, it, it has ele elements of compassion and mercy in it, undoubtedly. But um, that doesn't mean it's a pattern for reconfiguring the church so that we are, are, are clergy. Uh, I mean, it shouldn't just be about clergy, but of course, you know, the secular society is mo more interested in power and it sees clergy as having power. But if you, for example, you said, well, you know, all our prophets and our evangelists and our healers and our teachers and our administrators, they've got to have their fair quota of transgendered people in them as well. Um, you know, this, this would become utterly ridiculous. But because it's being sold, uh, because the politics of the present culture have seeped into the Church of England, people can no longer tell the difference between a secular, political, left-wing modification of society and the dynamics of the gospel and the call of the Holy Spirit. Ah, well, I'm just waiting, and it's going to happen at some point, because the one thing the Church of England loves to do is to gather and have a committee meeting and discuss something over a long period of time. When is it going to be a sin to be a white male in the Church of England? Um, because it looks like it's uh, certainly uh, a sin to be a white cyclist within London. <laughs> Do you guys fun. ever read the papers so, you write? I, 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 I like to bicycle once in a while. I got a nice little bike downstairs. I put my little helmet on, strap it there, and I go out along the shore here and, and have a like, nice little thing. And I get tan. See that? Whoa. You see that little tan? Oh, you see the white. I, I, There's the tan. And uh, <laughs> it is extraordinary. I looked at this picture of white cyclist in London you guys don't know. There's no tan. What, what's well, we, with we that? Get, we, well, we get wet quite a lot. Kevin, wet. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you're quite right. There's been a call from the mayor of London and for others um, to remedy the fact that the cyclists in London are largely white, male and middle class. And this is an offense to the new Marxism uh, because you can't have any category of people that doesn't subdivide reflectively along the right proportions. Um, as someone was saying to me the other day, well, you know, Muslim women in niqabs don't like to cycle around London. And you can see why. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, um, uh, women don't like to cycle as much as some men do because you have to have a certain amount of physical courage or carelessness to cycle uh, in London. I think we call it kahunis. You, you do. Yeah, um, we call it you, you, yeah. you. Uh, there's a certain, you know, it's quite aggressive cycling around London. And worse than that, we had some. We have a, a large number of cyclists being killed as they fall under the wheels of trucks or lorries as they turn. Mm -hmm. So actually, not everyone wants to cycle around. But if you, if you only see the word world through a lens of power and then identity politics. Um, then you can come up with some really stupid statements which say well, the cyclists of London don't represent the ethnic spread of the of the people of London. You could come up with other um, uh, other categories like 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 wealth or size of bicycle or height of cyclist or, or uh, you know or, or measures of sanity. But but of course it's all about essentially all about race. What's crazy is that when you see an idea like this. Uh, brought out as part of a social program for the re-engineering of something as mundane as cyclists. The idea that the Church of England has simply swallowed the whole the whole project whole mm. and is trying to apply it to those who are called to, to, to ministry and or priesthood by the Holy Spirit makes you just, well, you just, well, it makes you lament. How is it possible that, they, that they've stopped reading the Bible and are simply settled for a contemporary version of of Marxist egalitarianism, but that's where we've got to. Well, you and I have discussed this, you know, many episodes back. I remember Peter Old and I discussed this a couple times. You know, will the Church of England ever stand up and say it's time to disestablish? It's time to separate ourselves from the state, uh, because a lot of this, and you've seen it for you know dozens of years, is getting crazier mm -hmm. and crazier and crazier. Now, the Church of England, it doesn't help itself. Uh, you got the sexual scandals. You got the um, the old churches and and uh, the not just fighting culture, but becoming culture. You're not helping yourself. But at some point, is disestablishment from the the uh, the state the only way forward for the Church of England? Well, it's certainly true that if we had disestablishment, we couldn't have Conservative MPs in the House of Commons saying, uh, "You you you know." 
we insist with the force of law that you find more clergy bureaucrats to represent our identity politics as they do at the moment um, and they were I mean they're just they're just shouting and being stupid but but nonetheless it's it's an irritant I don't think that the legal relationship with the state is as important as the ideological relationship mm. so you know there are certain things that are advantages it's an advantage that the Church of England gets to marry a royal couple and and and, and if it used uh, its best talents to, to speak to two billion people you know that's a huge advantage if you do it well the real problem is that the church has bought in to the culture of the society um, it, it's actually almost impossible to disestablish the Church of England because it, it, it requires unraveling too many complex laws over too many centuries and there isn't the time or the money or the will to do it but even if there was it wouldn't be as important as finding the right spirit for the church the spirit the church needs is the Holy Spirit, the spirit in the Gospels, the spirit of transformation. And and you cannot serve two gods. The church will always be at odds with the state. What's terrifying at the moment is that the the spirit in the church under, under the present archbishop and house of bishops uh, appears to be identical to that of the state. And, you know, that that ought to cause people some alarm. Well, it really does cause people alarm. I, I, I get a steady stream of correspondence from people saying, we hear what you say, we also notice it for ourselves. What on earth are we going to do? Uh, there will come a point when we can no longer serve in the Church of England as it pursues identity politics uh, and a kind of raw sort of um, spiritualized socialism. Is, is there any way beyond this? And I think one of the things many of us are trying to do now is to pray and say to the Lord, well, you know, do you have a solution for us? Because there are a lot of lonely, pressured, compromised people out there who are deeply uncomfortable in the Church of England as it is at the moment, given the direction it's going in. Uh, yeah, it does seem the state and the church are stuck with each other. And uh, boy, I, I pray for your way forward. Gavin, another great show. Uh, boy, if you people are really interested in how good episode 400 is going to be, no idea. You know, <laughs> George is scheduled. Maybe we'll have a guest appearance with Gavin and some of the other people. Uh, excited about that. Please like us, share us, comment, subscribe, do all that things. Also subscribe to Gavin's prayer channel. I'll put a link up for that in the show notes. I'll put uh, a link to all the stuff we've been talking about. Good times. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to the last episode of the 300s. 399.